Good morning and welcome to today's Opportunity Zone Roundtable for HUD Regions uh, uh, 9 and 10. Um, we're excited to have today's um, conversation. Uh, today we'll be talking with Eric Yost. Uh, Eric will be leading our conversation on establishing an OZ, round, uh, OZ strategy and roadmap. Uh, Eric is the Senior Management Analyst with Opportunity Zones with the Department Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, Office of Field Policy and Management. I'll pass it over to Jonathan, who will give a brief introduction on housekeeping. Great. Thank you, Orlando, and welcome back, everyone. If you were able to join us on Tuesday, welcome back to day two. If you're here for the first time, welcome. I'm Jonathan Tarr with Enterprise Community Partners, and I'll just offer a couple of housekeeping notes on the Zoom platform. Uh, the chat function is disabled for participants, and uh, as attendees, you have all been muted upon entry. Uh, however, we do encourage your participation and your questions. So if you would like to ask a question uh, during our panel, uh, panel presentations, you can uh, use the Q&A function, which is in the bottom center of your Zoom window, and type a question at any point. Uh, during our discussions, you also have the option to use the raise hand function, which is right next to the Q&A feature. Uh, if you did want to ask a question to a panelist verbally, uh, you can uh, click the raise hand, and uh, the moderators will unmute you and call on you to ask your question verbally when we've come to the Q&A portion of uh, the event. If you do ask a question verbally, um, we also encourage you to turn on your camera when asking your question just so we can get a little more virtual interaction going in the Zoom environment. So uh, with that, I will also just note uh, we will be recording this session and we will send a recording as well as our presenter's slide decks to everyone that registered for this event within a week. And we'll have that posted on a publicly available box.com account. So you can look out for that message from me uh, within a week. So I think with that, we're ready to go ahead and get started. So Orlando, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. And I'm going to introduce Eric Yost uh, to kick us off. Thank you very much, Orlando and Jonathan and the Enterprise team. Um, I wanted to also welcome everyone to day two of HUD's Opportunity Zone webinar or a virtual um, round table and um, uh, focused on regions nine and 10 um, for HUD, which is our West Coast regions. And um, in today's session, we are going to look at things um, for both uh, two perspectives. Um, one is the perspective of our HUD grantees and how they can better understand how um, the federal government, um, the state government and local government are um, working within the Opportunity Zone ecosystem for economic development and aligning and targeting state, federal and local resources for capital stacks. And also from the perspective of any um, investors are those in the Opportunity Zone ecosystem that want to better learn how government um, can work with you as well in these places designated as Opportunity Zones. So um, with that, I wanted to share first kind of going through um, my portion of the presentation is going to be twofold is, is talking about um, the federal efforts on what's happening in the federal landscape of and national landscape for opportunity zones. And then I will turn it over to hear um, from um, our distinguished guests from um, uh, one from the state of California and the governor's office and another who represented local government who is now in um, private enterprise um, working and leveraging all the tools of local, federal and state government. So as many of you know, in the Biden-Harris administration and their plans um, running for office, there were two specific plans that referenced opportunity zones. So the Biden agenda for the Latino community um, talked about the reforming of opportunity zones to ensure that they serve, um, serve the Latino community, small businesses and homeowners. And then the second report was the racial equity plan, um, advancing racial equity across the American economy. 
And this is the one people probably are most familiar with. Um, and it references the reform to opportunity zones to ensure they serve black and brown communities, small business and homeowners with kind of a focus on three key areas um, that most people are probably well attuned to by now, which is how do we ensure that opportunity funds partner with nonprofits and community oriented organizations around creating more benefits for the community with a focus on the residents that live in um, opportunity zones. The other two around the areas of the tax benefits um, to show there's clear benefit or transparency and reporting and how that works would either take congressional action or regulatory or administrative action. So we're mostly gonna be focusing today really on the first part of these efforts on how we can continue to provide um, re uh, resources that can benefit the community. In addition, the industry has also um, recommended some reforms to opportunity zones and some top priorities for the administration. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for example, um, CDFA or the Council of Deve Development um, Finance Agencies had a list of proposals that they also recommended around opportunity zones. And interestingly, when I map these out, very similar to the Biden administration, um, many of these would take some acts of Congress or some regulatory changes other than the second one, which is continue to support opportunity zones um, policy at the highest levels of the administration and strengthen the federal delivery system of support to opportunity zones, really kind of providing this clear and consistent support through coordinated approaches across agencies to help communities to identify resources to attract investment. Um, the very last one on here on the recommendations was around the census tracts, and many of you are familiar with the IRS um, guidance that came out that kept um, the existing census tracts in place um, for even with the reconfiguration of census tracts. Um, and so when I look at opportunity zones and we talk about it today from both the federal, state and local perspective around planning and planning efforts around these census tracts, I really look at it from three perspectives. One is the perspective of what the private investment market is doing to invest in these communities through opportunity funds. Then we have the private investment market from others, which could include nonprofits, philanthropic organizations, or private in industry. And then you have the public investments being made by the federal, state, and local government into these census tracts and or in the capital stack of an investment with a qualified opportunity fund. And so it really brings together these uh, players together across the spectrum of economic development around these distressed communities um, and looking at how we can better coordinate policies, including federal policies around these areas and working with state and local government. What do we know to date? What we do know to date is in the Council of Economic Advisors report, they had shared that about 75 billion through 2019 had been identified in private qualified opportunity fund investment. What we also do know is that the federal government through the end of May has aligned um, over 500 uh, grants, different grants, um, specifically 400 unique grants and programs for over $30 billion to give preference or priority consideration to Opportunity Zones. So we know there's, you know, just in the federal and in the private markets through these time periods, over 105 billion of, of, of different funding sources that can flow to these communities. So what I wanna do now is kind of share with the importance of transactions that we do know. We do know that there is a lack of reporting requirements, but we do know is a lot of players have stepped up to share their best practices, share how they're providing good benefits to the community and sharing some of their transactions to show that these are truly um, integrating into what the needs of the community are. So I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a journey through a few of the states that we are representing through HUD's regions nine and 10. So we'll start with Arizona. Um, you will have the slide deck, so you'll be able to dive further into these um, examples, but I will highlight a few of them from each one while you're reading through some of the others or looking at this later um, as, you're, as you're going through this. So one that I wanted to highlight from Arizona is around the Greater Cleveland Partnership around um, a, a medical behavioral hospital in Phoenix. Um, and that, that investment, um, there's a, a fantastic video about that effort of helping for that community and getting 
um, that behavioral hospital um, built in Phoenix with, with Opportunity Zone funds. In addition, um, in Mesa, Arizona, um, a single fam family community that also has, um, is focused on sustainability and energy efficiencies around rental homes with uh, amenities and access to those amenities. In addition to, as you can see, jobs and other uh, effective homes. Moving over into California um, and moving into communities, you'll hear about some of these later, um, um, but looking at Madera, California and, and Hartridge Farms that created a fund to invest in growing net farming and, and processing business, or in San Jose, a senior housing facility that is receiving QF funds for assisted living and memory care units. Um, in addition, looking down in Southern California, um, there's uh, Link Housing, which is an affordable housing provider, is working on an apartment project in Long Beach with qualified opportunity funds for people experiencing homelessness. In addition, we're seeing kind of redevelopment of uh, um, underutilized industrial tracks in South Los Angeles for an opportunity zone business campus for black owned and brown owned entrepreneurs um, and investing in their business as well. In addition, um, the CDFI, um, the Clearinghouse Community um, Development Financial Institution is building a 31 unit uh, multifamily property in a vacant parcel in Koreatown. Um, and it'll be the first one, a CDFI sponsored one in the country, um, in addition to additional workforce housing and affordable housing. Moving into other parts of Southern California, um, you'll hear about the San Bernardino project from one of our guest speakers, but even in Orange County, we're seeing conversion of apartments to workforce housing with opportunity funds and um, a, a cultural apartment project around arts district. Um, moving into Idaho, um, we're seeing transactions um, in the state of Idaho that are around purchasing vacant and underutilized sites and replacing it with apartments to increase density in Twin Falls um, for more housing or an old clinic and hospital that's being revitalized to become a charter school. Um, moving over into the state of Washington, um, some transactions we've been seeing there includes a mixed use waterfront development with multifamily and hospitality uses. Um, we're also seeing multifamily projects built um, that are working with their tax exempt program with 20% 20, 20 of the units as workforce housing, in addition to other kind of specialty type uh, buildings and residential projects. Um, other developments in the state of, of Washington using QOF funds include equity investments um, with Bridge Investment Group, which is a multifamily affordable housing developer that's working on workforce housing, um, in addition to other workforce and other um, housing programs, um, affordable housing projects and senior housing developments. Moving into Alaska, um, we also see transactions in Alaska around a hotel that's helping with uh, the tourist economy and in Oregon, investing in a historic district um, as well. And out in Las Vegas, um, in the Las Vegas area, a partnership around affordable housing um, and development of 80% of the units being sold um, at market rate are geared towards veterans, seniors, and families, um, sold, uh, sorry, sold below the market rate. So when we talk about the transactions and how they're benefiting communities and how we're trying to ensure they benefit communities, I wanna focus on some of the Biden-Harris administration's key pr domestic priorities around equity, sustainable development and job creation um, and showing how there are people that are stepping up to ensure that qualified opportunity funds themselves and investments that they're making are benefiting communities. And we want to see more of this happening and highlighting and partnering with the efforts that you work on. So Mosaic Development Partners is a minority led real estate development company that's really focused on um, ensuring that they make positive change around women and minority owned business um, for construction, leasing and operations in um, Philadelphia around food deserts and um, working um, with HUD for our project based vouchers um, with the housing authority. In addition, um, a project um, that um, is, is fascinating in Columbus, Ohio is the Phoenix community, which is a mixed use project um, that with housing and supportive services for formerly incarcerated individuals to reduce recidivism. Um, this, this one and others like this where you see these kind of case study models off to the left are pub published on the Economic Innovation Group's website. Um, and they have more details about these, some of these uh, individual transactions. And you'll see this is a partnership with the state of Ohio 
um, that actually turns over the property with the first right of refusal back to the uh, nonprofit or faith-based organization um, at the at a, a predetermined kind of rate after a certain period of time. Or you'll hear about this one later, so I'm going to skip over this one, but I wanted to highlight that there is a a document on this, um, and you'll hear about the Fuse Fellow that actually worked on this transaction in San Bernardino, California, um, which has a strong social impact. Um, and you'll hear about this uh, this investment with San, Diego, San Bernardino County. Another one around equity is a project out in Washington, D.C. with the sponsors that are really focused on um, a development that's kind of one of the first in, in a long time that's um, moving even a business into this area of Washington, D.C. and the focus on ensuring um, that uh, there's uh, engagement with uh, residents and the community and work and equity from LISC and others um, and new market tax credits that really focus in on ensuring the benefits flow to the community in addition to the qualified opportunity fund um, equity. Another transaction I thought might be kind of interesting, and, and we shared this with our Opportunity Zone work in, in the Chicago team, is a project that is um, working on an independent film distribution facility in the south side of Chicago, where there's a lot of efforts in Chicago around their parcels that they are working on. And the city has actually looked at ensuring that all the parcels that they're working on the south side of Chicago that are in Opportunity Zones or not that the city owns, I actually have to prove that they're showing some avenue of, of building community wealth um, in the individual transactions and ensuring a lot of community engagement. So a place where the city is stepping up to ensure that happens. Moving over to kind of even the social determinants of health, we're seeing funds such as Nightingale um, Partners that is focused on really investing in businesses and organizations that are focused on helping um, underserved communities and building marketplaces for those that are focused on um, uh, connecting health and housing together. Um, in addition, we're seeing companies that are formed, um, this Black Millennial Company in Atlanta that is focused on aligning their efforts um, and, and work in opportunity zones and funding around the UN sustainability goals. So focused even on the broader um, international goals of sust sustainability. In addition, there's a fund um, called Solar um, that's uh, in Norfolk um, that is focused on um, their belief that low income communities and communities of color bear a disproportionate share of utility bills um, than wealthier families. And so through their studies and efforts, they're helping investors through qualified opportunity funds identify and deploy solar on businesses and nonprofits within opportunity zones across the state of Virginia and um, they will get, uh, they can apply for free solar um, with this organization. Um, in addition, in Puerto Rico, that's seen their fair share of disasters um, and a lot of efforts to revitalize um, the community in Puerto Rico and the island. Um, we're seeing funds that are focused on sustainable businesses and renewable energy pro projects in, um, in Puerto Rico. Um, in addition, around the energy and resilience economy, we're seeing a fund like Greenwave Opportunity Zone Fund that's focused on um, clean energy projects and businesses and building kind of through uh, real estate or water applications and their fund is really focused on jobs and providing diverse income streams around um, the green economy and energy resiliency. Um, one thing that you may have heard is the federal government has also aligned and targeted federal grants and programs and through June 9th, um, 20, 20 federal agencies have aligned 511 uh, grants in total, 364 unique grants, meaning they've been, you know, released more than once, and 54 unique programs. Um, and these either offer preference points, priority consideration, or some targeted benefit for activities in a promise zone, or, or sorry, excuse me, in an opportunity zone. We do publish a list of those. Um, many of these grants are on grants.gov, a majority of them on there. Sorry, this is really small, but uh, the list is long, um, but this is more for illustrative purposes of kind of how many grants are open at a, a different time. Um, HUD specifically, and, and, and as a representative of HUD, I wanted to share, here's our list of unique grants at HUD. So we have 29 different unique grants that have offered opportunity zone benefits, um, preference points or priority consideration. And that is over 50 grants in total. Many of these have been released in different fiscal years. And that is over $2 billion. 
In addition, we've offered a variety of programs that we have or other type of uh, grants that we have that are more block grant, not the competitive grants, where we've offered specific guidance or um, priority efforts around um, uh, opportunity zones. Um, you heard many of them on Tuesday around our CDBG funds and Section 108 funds, the neighborhood revitalization strategy areas, and other efforts. Um, when you get this uh, slide deck, you'll have some of these guidance documents specifically referenced on Tuesday around the consolidated planning process, guidance for those funds and opportunity zones, efforts through our neighborhood revitalization strategy areas and opportunity zones, and, and um, as you heard on Tuesday as well, leveraging Section 108 with OZ financing and a future webinar will be focused specifically on that. So interestingly, as I shared, you know, federal agencies have been aligning these federal grants and programs um, to opportunity zones. I wanna share just even a few recent announcements. So it was June 4th, um, the FTA um, made a grant um, for um, efforts uh, for a bus rapid transit line and you can see in the, uh, in the press release, they said this route is gonna run through six federally recognized opportunity zones um, and how this transit will help the community. Or the EPA, um, who I'll talk about a little bit later in their region six, had a press release about Oklahoma City receiving 300,000 in brownfield assessments. And they said the assessment activities will focus on their neighborhood revitalization strategy strategy area, which is partially located in a qualified opportunity zone. Um, so the focus of today now is going to dive into how to leverage your, your uh, HUD's two toolkits. So we have an opportunity zone toolkit volume one and toolkit volume two. The first one was a roadmap to planning and economic development. And the second one is a guide to local best practices and case studies. These toolkits provide kind of a roadmap for helping local government and state government to see how they can align opportunity zones and create that ecosystem that's needed to attract capital, whether it's through private capital, co-op capital, or even public funding um, for these opportunity zones. And there's a series of questions that are asked in the toolkit to help you to think through those strategies, as many people have already been doing as this incentive is, is uh, continuing. And what we're looking at now is this kind of shift from community development. And as I shared a little bit about how Chicago is looking at their parcels um, and looking at this focus on building wealth within community and starting those discussions about the racial inequities that we need and injustices about how we can help these communities to build wealth. And so organizations like Policy Link have come up with recommendations for opportunity zones to incorporate in strategies that include discussions of equitable growth, development without displacement, and around healthy communities and driving equity um, around um, uh, health and, and health in communities. In addition, the US Impact Investing Alliance similarly came up with a framework for guiding principles focused on community engagement, equity, transparency, measurement, and outcomes, all of which are a strong um, efforts to help and align to, the, to what the administration is focused on. I want to share a couple of examples of, of HUD's engagements um, in, in the West here and what we've been doing with Opportunity Zones. So, for example, in the state of Nevada, um, there's an organization called the Culinary Institute of Las Vegas, who's been doing a lot of work with, especially during the pandemic, around um, helping their, their workforce that's been focused on the hospitality industry. But part of that effort is a collaboration with the Nav Nevada Governor's Office of Economic Development and looking at where they may relocate or expand their facilities um, into actually an opportunity zone that's closer to where their workers are. And recently there was a visit by Vice President Kamala Harris to this um, who visited in March um, the site and working around their space needs and helping them um, to, to address this area in the community they want to help to revitalize. Or in um, California and South Los Angeles, working with um, Sola Impact Fund, many people are familiar with it, it or one of those um, great organizations that are focused on impact investing and their work around um, both in South Los Angeles, but their broader work on the Black Impact Fund that they are, are investing in and raising a billion dollars of capital that is focused primarily now on the West Coast, but as they are expanding and potentially looking at expanding to other areas of the country, but with a primary focus on the areas in the West Coast, which we're talking about today. 
HUD has offered a series of webinars and tools and resources to date. So everything from um, helping with underwriting to public housing authorities to recently um, even around tribal communities. And in, in December, we held a whole series around these toolkits that you can dive into and get more details about. On May 19th last month, we held a second of a three-part series for tribal communities on Opportunity Zones, and we will be hosting a third part of that. Um, the first recording is up. When the second recording is up, I'll be sure to uh, make sure everybody knows, but you can always go to our HUD Exchange website and look those up as well. Um, we are conducting, as I mentioned, these roundtables. This is the third of a three-part series that we're doing with enterprise community partners in three areas of the country. Um, and uh, uh, regions two, sorry, there's a typo on here, region seven um, and, and five together, and then our regions nine and 10. Um, also wanted to share, um, as many as you know, there's a lot of research that's been published recently about opportunity zones. HUD is gonna be issuing an opportunity zone um, consortium um, publication in our cityscape with a lot of research, but one of the more recent ones you've probably heard is the research from JCT, um, the Joint Center of Taxation, around the initial data for the first partial year of the initiative um, and the tax incentive. Um, and in addition to that, the Economic Innovation Group um, and work with Novogratic um, released some interesting data that, that um, kind of updates that report and provides some more insights to that. So while you're looking at these, um, these reports that are issued, it's always important to kind of look at additional efforts of more the way the trends are going. And I'm gonna share some data around the trends of what's happened since that report that was issued was uh, for December, 2019 data. So for example, in the state of Indiana, we can see the investments happening across the state in, in Ohio even. Um, we have data in Ohio because Ohio has a comparable tax incentive where at least 28 tracks received investment of um, compared to 50 in 2020 and 46 already in 2021. So we're seeing that this increase of 28 um, census tracks, OZs in 2019, you know, 50 in 2020 and 46 already in 2021. So we're seeing kind of a widespread across the state of Ohio from their data as we're seeing what's happened in 2019 to now 2020 and what's happening in 2021. Novogratic obviously collects data around their Opportunity Zone funds that self-report to them. In April, they provided a recent update to their report. And of course, they show that there were 708 funds that they're tracking around 16.34 billion. You can see a majority is in residential, but we're seeing an increase in business and in other areas of renewables um, as well, um, and in the commercial side. And what I wanted to share with this is because this is just a portion of the opportunity funds that are out there, is the importance to look at trending. And so when you look at the funds that, that, that Novogratic has looked at, you can see a continual trend upward and, and money going into qualified um, opportunity funds, both from the equity side of what's uh, raised or what they're proposing to raise. And when you're looking at where those the funds are being invested in, yes, there is a significant portion that's going into multifamily or into real estate because those are in the pipeline can quickly attract that source of capital and we're seeing funds all as well go in the residential side and affordable housing, mixed use, workforce housing, student housing, and senior housing. And you can see that the, the equity amounts from just the portion that they're, they're raising. Interesting trend is we're seeing a shift in kind of large funds happening across the country to more single city focused. And I think that's because a lot of the equity that's being raised is locally raised for local projects um, that's happening as we're seeing kind of the shift of the larger funds to single city funds. And where we're seeing the investment happen, as you can see from this list alone that Novogratic published in a wide variety of cities, although this is not the, the comprehensive list of all the cities and places across the country, these are just large cities that have opportunity zones. Another interesting trend we're seeing is the change in the funds. So instead of a lot of large funds, what you're seeing is like in this you know, over half of the, the equity they're reporting on here is in uh, 32 large funds, but you're seeing a lot of smaller fund sizes. So 414 smaller funds that are less than 10 million. Other directories, um, the Opportunity DB has a directory. Um, as of June 15th, they're showing 64 billion in capital in just 292 funds. So they have different numbers of funds, you know, very different than than Novogratz, um, 700, but a much larger amount. 
Um, the National Council State Housing Finance Agencies has a, a directory of funds. As of May 7th, they had 48 billion in anticipated funds, but only 233 funds. And we know that number is probably much more significant and larger, probably likely in the 6,000 range. Um, Economic Innovation Group publishes an amazing map of where the funds are located and transactions of self-reported that they may get as well. And now I'm going to talk about a couple resources before I turn it over to our next set of speakers. So one speaker you're going to hear from is through someone through an organization called Fuse. And Fuse had embedded Opportunity Zone fellows in, in counties and cities in, in California um, that I had the distinct honor and privilege to work with along with the California Governor's Office. Um, so you'll be hearing about that. In addition, um, Octaris Impact Investors have invested in building ecosystems in the country. Just the demand alone from their last round of applications, these are the list of cities that applied from across the country as they'll be announcing those awards. Um, another organization called Cities of Service um, had partnered with the federal agency that's now called AmeriCorps of bringing AmeriCorps VISTA volunteers and guiding them through and working with communities. For example, working in Lafayette, Louisiana around environmental justice for their opportunity zones and AmeriCorps VISTAs. Or the Economic Development Administration, another federal agency funding in Utah to create a playbook for their opportunity zone investments in the state of Utah. Or our partners at the USDA and working in rural development have partnered in Indiana of creating, um, helping them to create um, uh, an ecosystem in the state of Indiana for their opportunity zones. In addition, our partners at the EPA have created some amazing toolkits. So one toolkit that I highly recommend that can be leveraged for communities around this focus on, on community investment and in the community is their document called Building a Community Prospectus that takes it beyond an investment prospectus, but looking at it from the centric viewpoint of the community and the residents in the community and telling that compelling story for investments. In addition, um, the Qualified Opportunity Fund industry and the Opportunity Funds Association continues to advocate for opportunity zones and talking about this cross-coordination of opportunity zones and testifying to, to, um, to Congress about how federal agencies can optimize their efforts of supporting community development. Economic Innovation Group writing letters to the White House and Treasury also talked about federal fundings for states and communities and what that could look like and recommending how community leaders has expressed an interest for more technical assistance and help uh, ways, including HUD's efforts around that as in what we're trying to offer with this webinar series. Um, some last couple tools I wanted to share here um, are with LISC and other federal partners that we shared and you'll have access to those and one and two from EPA are five strategies for engaging opportunity zone investors. And then another um, a, a good publication they have is leveraging development financing tools to attract opportunity zone investment. So I wanted to thank everyone for your time. Um, from hearing from me, I'm gonna hold off on my questions till after I can get to the next two speakers. And first I'd like to introduce Trey Bradley, who's a senior business development specialist for the greater Los Angeles region for, and working on place-based initiatives who's an appointee with California Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. So I'll turn it over to you, Trey. Thank you, Eric, and thank you for that warm introduction. And thank you to HUD and to the team uh, for organizing this event today. It's great to be here to talk about opportunity zones um, and also to talk about how they are able to be useful to the community and be impactful, both from a project standpoint with working with private development and also with public investment. Uh, so I will quickly share my screen because today I will be not presenting slides. I will be actually presenting a website. So are you able to see that? We're good to go? Good to go. Awesome. Great. So uh, us at California, before we had a, you know, a website that was kind of a little bit of clunky, but what we are as the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development is we're supposed to be the point of contact for communities, uh, economic development partners, um, businesses and trying to achieve their goals, both in support of businesses, but also in larger in economic development, for example, creating new markets, starting entrepreneurship initiatives, these types of efforts that happen across our state. And given our varied regions, we, you know, we really had to take a step back and think about what our communities really wanted to see if we really projected ourselves out there with opportunity zones. We've always taken the position as California that 
with opportunity zones, we really want to push the incentive to align with projects that align with state goals that we have laid out within the state of California, such as our renewable energy goals and climate goals, our goals around equity or our goals around, you know, affordable housing and housing development. Um, the main thing that we have to do is, uh, we had to do as GoBiz is annually, we are required to host an annual convening on opportunity zones and promise zones. This annual convening really is a place, a launching pad for us to have a larger discussion about the incentives within California, but then also to touch about on other place-based initiatives that may align with opportunity zones and promise zones. Um, and with, with that, the most recent convening we've had, we've had two thus far, of course, which we've had Eric as a speaker on um, and to speak about opportunity zones. Uh, we, we, after the second engagement, we really released a survey because we had a lot of feedback that there was a lot of community interest in having more technical assistance resources, more uh, website material that came from the state that described, you know, different types of programs that could be paired with opportunity zones. Uh, different toolkit type mechanisms that could be used by developers and opportunity zone projects. Um, and then of course, also updating our mapping tool to uh, include more different type of incentive overlinement to be able to see where opportunity zones are falling in the same place as California state programs um, and investments. And so that really takes us to here, which we have just launched this new website about a little bit over a week ago. Um, of course, it's very uh, simple on the front end but the most important piece we have at the state of California are communities looking to find where opportunity zones are um, and both businesses and developers also asking the same. Um, so we really created a new map. We updated our fields within our mapping tools to be able to see, have communities, investors, developers, see different parts of planning within the development process uh, in opportunity zone execution, You know where we have a program called Recycling Market Development Zones, which provides low cost financing. You know, where are the promise zones within California? Where are the investments that the state is making in climate or SB1 with transportation? Or where are high-speed rail stations going to be, for example? Of course, high-speed rail station being a hard stop and an interest to developers, you know, and, and co-locating near that with projects that we want in California, which is affordable housing, clear, clear access to transit, um, and, and, you know, really sustainable projects to be able to accompany that large infrastructure project. And then, you know, we really wanted to take people back to the beginning with opportunity zones and really kind of what the state of California's message is with the incentive. Uh, really here in California, we really work closely with local communities in the selection process of, of census tracts to ensure that census tracts were really aligned with what the merit and goal of the incentive were to support low income communities. And we're also grateful for a lot of HUD's partnership and being able to identify those areas and local community partners who feel that opportunity zones were, um, you know, of something that is very of interest to a community to be able to highlight. We went down and kind of said, you know, we remodeled this page because people are often asking, what do opportunity zones do? How do they work for my community? And, um, you know, there is the tax incentive in the market that we are all very familiar with, but there's also a lot of rural areas or folks who may not be interested in the tax incentive. So we're trying to also think in broader economic development, there are a lot of elements of opportunity zones other than the tax incentive that are very beneficial. Of course, one of which Eric mentioned in the federal priority, priority pointing. So we really took people about what are opportunity zones. These are low income communities, areas of need and economic distress. Distress. These are areas that are you know places where there has been not as much maybe private or public investment in the past. Um, and then, of course, we wanted to show folks that where are opportunity zones in California? No two opportunity zones are the same. We have large census tracts. We have very small census tracts. We have those that are on tribal government lands. We have those that are shared in, you know, with military bases. There's a complete diverse array of opportunity zones within California. And really not to have people think that they're all the same. Really to have people who are investors and developers to really be at the community and census tract level to understand what are the needs within that area that align with what I'm trying to do with my goals and projects with in economic development. And that's where we really took people to three areas. Um, and, and, and the first area is really about the convening power of opportunity zones. We really think that this is one of the prime uh, pieces of opportunity zones that make it so great. 
uh, for economic development. It is really a really strong convening agent at the local level to think about a census track of need. Um, I don't. I know that we're all virtually here and we're all on a Zoom platform, but I'm sure that many folks in community and economic development have been to an opportunity zone meeting before the pandemic. And you notice there is a lot of different people from all sorts of types of different groups and backgrounds within the meeting. That is very unique uh, in, of, in and of itself. So we really want to push communities to say, hey, use this as a means to start a conversation about something within your community, whether that's you know housing or infrastructure or small business or entrepreneurship. Um, and then, you know, really we wanted to touch touch, of course, on the tax incentive. And then the last thing is the federal priority consideration, which I'm just I'm just going to open up this tab specifically because I think it's something that a lot of communities have leveraged in the pandemic. And that is that more than 200 plus federal programs uh, grants that have that alignment and preferential pointing consideration, considering so much federal funding has been released by grant means or other means. Um, there have been a lot of communities that have been looking to leverage this. They're going for grant applications on grants.gov or other places to be able to you know, share that their opportunity zone or how they're using that grant to serve the communities within the opportunity zone um, to be able to go get that preferential pointing or consideration in that grant application. And uh, we really wanted to kind of take about what are the main categories that people are interested in with opportunity zones. And I think that I want to say that the convening agent power of opportunity zones is very strong. When we have folks reach out to us in the state of California, these are kind of the main 10 topic areas we were able to rank that people reach us out, reach out to us on. They re housing is obviously huge. Um, you know, how does my business benefit from opportunity zones? How can I, you know, access from a business perspective? How does this relate to climate change or being a part of the green economy or, you know, serving for environmental justice? Um, and then, you know, there's always a question of community. You know, how do I, you know, think about things like community centers um, you know, parks, you know, some types of recreation aspect. Uh, healthcare, we actually have a large interest in doing healthcare clinics with OZ funding and financing. Um, and so, especially in rural areas, so rural healthcare, healthcare clinics is an area of high interest in using OZ capital. Um, of course, infrastructure, which I think we're all familiar with in terms of interest from OZ. Um, also rural, a lot of rural communities in California, how does this work for me? What are ways that I can maybe make this happen? And then transportation, workforce, and of course, small business. And um, I'll just take to kind of maybe one of these pages here that, that we have to say how kind of how we structure these pages is we really were thinking about a lot of the questions that we were getting in at the state level from communities, from developers, from investors. They're able to, you know, First of it, first of it's always where are the opportunity zones, and then they're always trying to find out, oh, is this address qualify? Second is, you know, kind of understanding what the regulations are. Third is always kind of something like, what else can I use with opportunity zones? How can I align opportunity zone private capital with some other type of incentive program? You know, in of and of itself, uh, you know, it's 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 sometimes not enough in the equation, but the capital stack overall is you know how can i bring in something else a, a, a grant program for housing or or infrastructure financing from our infrastructure and economic development bank so that's really why we created this page to just kind of say like you know look california is big you know in terms of doing infrastructure development here are some of the programs that we have that do that work they pair well with opportunity zones for xyz reason and, um, you know, we're really kind of just making this a place where folks can then just see the state programs. We have something like 32 state supportive programs across these opportunity areas, what we're calling them, and just seeing those programs and then taking them right to the program that they can then use to then supplement or, you know, be a partner in what they're trying to do with OZ Capital. Um, and then the next piece is we, you know, we kind of have links to a lot of our resources, which folks were asking about, where can I find state grants? Um, what are promise zones? You know, we, we, we do get a lot of interest from promise zones. And, and I know that we have, there, you know, we have four within the state of California, all many of which have a lot of opportunity zones within them. Uh, but obviously a great other place-based tool that, uh, you know, with HUD leadership, that a lot of folks are looking into because of its ability to garner community involvement and in project development. Um, so there, you know, we really wanted to explain also what promise zones are uh, because we did get a lot of questions in on that front as well. 
Um, and then I know that Eric mentioned the piece about the EPA community investment prospectus piece. Uh, this was another feedback. We had a lot of communities and cities and counties saying, I've created a prospectus. Where can I put it in a place at a, you know, a higher level at the state or something like that? That was a big piece of feedback that we received. So we, uh, you know, we went around the state and we kind of did a little bit of our own research and then GoBiz. And we found, you know, communities that had their pages on opportunity zones or their prospectuses. And, um, you know, I'm really going to shout out one of our, our fellows here who did a lot of this work uh, within GoBiz. Um, um, but, the, you know, it was really to find those cities and counties uh, that, that kind of have information that is relative to their specific area on opportunity zones. Uh, some of them are in the very structured form of the prospectus. Some of them are light, you know, it's a web page where they're talking about they have maybe quotes from businesses within their area about why OZs are important. We wanted to capture that all in one place so that investors or developers or folks who are interested in community economic development could come and see the diverse regions of California and see that all of these cities and counties are participating within the interest of opportunity zones. Um, so then uh, that was one piece of feedback too as well. Um, and I know that a lot of other states have these tools uh, also. But you know, there's a lot of tools within the state of California for what I would call value capture tools. Uh, there, I guess that would be the word to say them widely. We've kind of labeled them here economic development districts, but we have tools that um, use tax increment financing. We used to have redevelopment in California. It was uh, dissolved during the Brown administration. We brought back a slew of tools that still use property or sales tax increment financing. Um, but it's not a tax, right? We're really sharing with OZ, uh, you know, OZ developers and investors. And then of course, with the communities who are now designing them and building these new tools that we've created since redevelopment, that these are really value capture tools. And why do they align well with opportunity zones? Because sometimes OZ capital has got the smaller lifespan of a project. Um, you know, a, some type of value capture tool, maybe have a 40 to 45 year window in the life of the project to be able to service the project. Not only that, but at the front end, you know, developers are often trying to find a means to finance infrastructure that may be put on the onus of the developer and project development. These value capture tools may be able to lower their cost of overhead and project development. Um, and so, so most of these are kind of using tax increment financing in some form or a special assessment. Um, and then, of course, we have a few tools in here that streamline CEQA, which is the California Environmental Quality Act for affordable housing projects. Um, you know, so if you create a specified zone, a, a qualified affordable housing projects in that area do not have to undergo uh, environmental review. And, and the most popular one is the Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District, which I'll share here, which was really the governor's message was to align EIFDs and OZs. Uh, and that is something that uses property tax increment. It's capturing future uh, value and property tax to be able to do economic development for infrastructure to support a project. So if you think about it, OZ Capital comes in to do an affordable housing project, tax increment financing tool or value capture tool comes in to do the bikeways, the, you know, the infrastructure for utility and so on and so forth in a project. Uh, and then the really, we have two, we have three more pa pages I'll share. One is that we, you know, not every census tract has private OZ Capital. Um, and there's areas of the state from California that have not seen private OZ Capital, at least to our knowledge. Um, and so we really wanted to share that although there is maybe not a private OZ capital project, state public investments that we are making in state grant programs are very much aligned and attuned with the areas that are identified as opportunity zones. Um, so the, we really wanted to create a page that highlighted state of California public investments within opportunity zones, because it's really about the original intent of the message of the incentive, right? We want to support these areas of need and economic distress in both recovery and you know and business support in every facet, uh, you know, with respect to climate and climate and environment, right? With pollution, and these are some of the same areas that are the most impacted from a pollution perspective historically within California. So we created this page to you know highlight either areas or businesses. For example, this is a small business within an opportunity zone census tract that received a uh, recycling market development loan. Uh, zone mar recycling market development zone loan. Uh, and then we have, you know, we also highlighted like areas, for example, and I'll point to downtown Fresno. 
uh, where we, you know, pick downtown Fresno, we talk about the opportunity zone census tracts, and then the specific state investments that we have made within those areas, and then the amount of those investments, and then a little bit about like kind of what this area is, and then taking them back, if there's folks who are coming in here, or investors and developers, taking them back to those opportunities pages so that they can see state aligned programs that support opportunity zones. So kind of creating a circular pattern of saying like, look, there's multiple ways to spur investment in, in economic and community development in these areas. And then with the private transactions, of course, which sev several that uh, Eric, Eric mentioned. Um, and then we really want to create a page. Of course, we have a fill out form where we want locals and communities to share projects within the area. But in the same fashion that we're sharing projects that um, you know, are state public investments, we wanna highlight those initiatives where private capital or the OZ equity market has come to fruition to do a great project within the area. And, and, and I think Eric mentioned Hotel Fresno here, as well as Hartridge, Hartridge Farms. You know, we really want to highlight those specific investments that happened. This was a hotel that was essentially vacant since 1983. It's a beautiful property within Fresno. It's not far from the high-speed rail station, but a great example of an OZ transaction. And so we want to be able to highlight those OZ transactions um, and also so when they combine with uh, public investment too. And then the last was trying to, you know, create a place-based resource toolkit or something like this. Um, and this was really a page because we had developers and investors and communities who were saying, you know, there's these great tools around different agencies that support community and economic development. Um, is there a place where they're like all together on one page? You know, the page that talks about where, you know, environmental review streamlining is available, where you can find state surplus property. We have, for example, surplus property, and we put our opportunity zones on that mapping tool uh, to be able to see where developers potentially could develop housing in opportunity zones using former state-owned property, uh, or the high-speed rail sta state map, which is another map that we've added OZ to. How can we, you know, find all these in one place? And so uh, that was really, this was really actually more so a feedback from the developer side. It's, um, to create this type of page that includes, you know, whatever state GIS or funding wizard tools to exist here. Um, and then that's kind of basically the site. What I'll close out is saying that this is the big update that we have done. And we've done this update specifically because we've received that feedback from communities, developers, investors, businesses across the state. What we've really had here within California is we've done something at GoBiz, which was really seek out our federal partners to bring them to assist us with both not only opportunity zones and promise zones, but other things in economic and community development, COVID funding, for example. Um, so when the pandemic happened, we really worked with folks like Eric to find folks within California who are you know, in the EDA and the EPA to create a federal partners group where we have federal agencies meet bi-weekly to discuss different projects and areas of California that we're working on, different updates, um, and so, you know, we really were trying to make it as much as seek out different state and federal agency partners that have funding that align with this incentive to be able to support it in the way that it was designed to do, which is support low income and economically distressed communities uh, within our state. So we're really enthusiastic about the new developments that Eric mentioned. Of course, we updated our site recently. So we are, we understand that this incentive is very, very, um, you know, not only popular, but it is very important in the equation of thinking about economic recovery and economic resilience as we move forward within California. So thank you, Eric. And with that, I'll pause and I think we're gonna turn over to the next folks. Okay. Thank you so much, Trey. Um, and excited to, to uh, ask you a few questions after we go to our next presenter here. So let me uh, flip over to a slide here real quickly. And I'd like to present um, our next uh, distinguished speaker, uh, Gil Keenan and Gil was a FUSE fellow um, who worked in San Bernardino County, um, soon to be doctor. Um, hopefully we'll hear that soon, uh, uh, Gil. Um, he's working on his uh, doctorate right now. Um, and um, excited to have you hear from Gil's perspective of someone that has actually worked in, um, in, in local economic development um, in the county for a year and across the cities in a county and is now focused on providing additional support around that. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Gil. 
Thanks, Eric. Uh, we, our session today goes until 12 noon. It is 11.26, so I'll try to keep it short so we have some time for q and I'll rush through things on purpose. If you have any questions thereafter, feel free to send us a note. Next slide, please, Eric. Um, so um, a little bit about myself. I started as a minibar guy. I speak a number of languages, as you might, you might pick up from my accent. Started as a minibar guy in hotels. I worked a good number of years in hotels and then went into private equity and worked for a large fund investor that invested in hotels. We invested in multifamily. We invested in mixed use. We were truly uh, focused on creating communities that support each other. So when we went in and we bought a hotel, we focused on also buying residential, also buying the mall, the office, so that it creates the jobs and, and, the, and the social impacts that came along with our investment. We truly believed in making a change and a difference along the way. And so I left that fund two and something years ago in 2018. Uh, started on my own, and and then, and that's when one of the opportunities that opened up was to work um, was a nonprofit called Fuse Corp that uh, wanted to place a person in local government uh, in the county of San Bernardino to enhance this tool that was called Opportunity Zones. You know, the county of San Bernardino is the largest county in the United States, guys. If anyone ever uh, got on their Harley and drove from LAX to Vegas, as soon as you leave LA County and until you reach the border of Nevada, you're going through the County of San Bernardino. Uh, and, and the county encompasses a lot of geographic areas between the village, the, the valley, the low desert, the mountains, the high desert. So there's a lot of varying geographies. And when I came on board and, and the focus was really, hey, let's create a program. Let's create a strategy to attract investment into our low income, distressed neighborhoods, distressed communities, many of which were qualified opportunity zones. And, and you know, the, the, the focus was, let's listen. Let's, let's figure out what's really needed. So we took time and we, we went around. I was partnered with a number of people within the economic development uh, um, department in the county and work closely with the community development at the county as well. I see my friend Gary Helen today on the, on the, on the Zoom, uh, shout out to you. And, um, and we, we listened to them and, they, and a lot of the, the, the reoccurring feedback, not surprisingly, was we need infrastructure in certain areas, we need good jobs, we need housing, lots of housing. We're Southern California. We need good jobs and we need support for, for small business. But different areas, slightly different levels of priority to each one of them. The other thing that we've observed is that in many areas, we have what's called financing deserts. I call it that, some industry experts call it that. We don't have enough CDFIs. We don't have enough community development entities, uh, small business investment corporations, minority depository institutions. So when you think about HUD programs that are supposed to partner with those parties, if they're not available on the ground and they don't understand the community, they can't partner with the community, that's a problem right there. And so we created some strategies, uh, one of which was let's, let's drive education and technical assistance. Let's do meetings and Zooms and create a deal marketplace and create a website and create a video. There's a really cool doodle video about what Opportunity Zones are all about. It's on, on the website um, uh, of, of San Bernardino County. Uh, the second one was let's focus on areas that don't have city support. Uh, let's create a marketing message why investors should come there. What should, what, who should be the right parties that should look at it? What type of investors, what kind of lenders and so on and so forth. And the fourth, as the county being the in-betweener between federal, state, and city government, let's support the cities in their own efforts. Let's create some prospectuses. Let's, let's, uh, let's be that resource when the, when the city doesn't have that. Let's be that phone call away to support that investor or that developer in an opportunity zone. And really at the heart of all of that, we were focused on the geographies and on the neighborhood rather than on the capital. A lot of the media buzz out there is, well, this capital, capital gains tax and so on. We are focused on the people who live in those communities. We're focused on advancing those communities, regardless of where that capital comes from. 
Um, now, the, 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 uh, one of the deals that actually happened while, while I was fortunate to work with the County of San Bernardino as, as a Fuse Fellow uh, is this uh, medical center. It's a, it's a 12,000, 11,500 square foot medical office building that is located in the city of San Bernardino in a census tract that is distressed and low income as you can qualify for an opportunity zone. Uh, it was a building that the county needed to have built for uh, the, the Department of Behavioral Health. They put it out in an RFP and, the, and very little developers came forward. A lot of them needed a lot of support. And, and so we were able to bring in an, an, an impact investor out of Orange County who stepped up with capital gains uh, proceeds through an opportunity zone structure to invest uh, they were able to, to get some low cost financing because there was CRA credit associated with it as well. And, and here we are actually, the, the, uh, the uh, ribbon cutting was just three weeks away. Uh, it took around, I'm going to say 18 months construction, maybe slightly less. And it's a phenomenal project that will serve uh, the young people in this community uh, through the Department of Behavioral Health. Um, now, one of the things that we've observed along the way is that a lot of the work that needs to get done in order to attract investment into those communities is an investment focus. It is speaking to investors to, cre to, to, to create the underwriting, to show returns, and to really look at the geography. It's not necessarily just about San Bernardino or about one city. It really is about a geographic effort to market oneself to, to the world. Uh, Eric, next slide, please. And, and so the, the, uh, the, the effort was born, Local Equity is a local, local economic development organization that I've, I've founded. We believe in partnering with organizations on the ground, which are local governments, county government, uh, nonprofits, CDFIs, those that are available, and so on and so forth, as well as developers, to really advance community priority projects. Um, we, we, we don't take projects that don't have social returns. And I'll talk in a second about what it means to have social returns. And we're current, we currently have projects all around the county of San Bernardino as well as in Fresno. And so we're fortunate to be busy. Uh, uh, Eric, next slide, please. And so a, a lot of the work that we do is, is on, is, framed in capital absorption framework. And I recommend anybody on, on the uh, webinar to just Google what it means. But at the federal level, multiple federal agencies tailored the programmatic requirements and the subsidy programs, as Eric highlighted, uh, to, to invest in opportunity zone uh, projects. Uh, state and local governments have done that too. And they offer tax rebates, fast tracking, permitting, infrastructure subsidies, some of the stuff that, that Trayland spoke about. The general strategy behind all of these efforts is to communicate to investors that there are lending and investment opportunities available that are supported by the community. The best of these efforts communicates not only a clear strategy, but the political will to grow and develop the area over the long haul. It's a big plus for a developer to see that uh, and, and, and when they put money, uh, uh, when, they, when they consider the risk in a project. Anybody looking to finance a project in an unproven or developing market, guys, and majority of opportunity zones are that. Um, they want to know that there's commitment among the community and local leadership to get a deal across the finish line. It starts with understanding the project and the priority and the, and the returns on a community and the public sector level but there are also partners that will provide subsidies, credit enhancements, permitting, um, and whatever else is needed really in order to get it done and, and that they will step up in case there's problems. And more often than not, there's problems. This system of people and organizations and relationships that helps get deals done has been called the capital absorption capacity of a place or the community investment ecosystem. We speak a lot about ecosystem. That capacity uh, or ecosystem is built in a framework of shared priorities. It includes a pipeline of projects that meet those priorities, an enabling environment that gets the deal done, and a management and a monitoring function that solves the problems and eliminates barriers. 
to develop the, and implement something like that it requires leadership, relationship, ability to adapt to new opportunities and coordination. That's where the local equity really plays. We do that number two and number three on your screen and help government and, and nonprofits play that. I often like to say that we don't do community engagement. We partner with organizations that do that on the ground. Eric, next slide, please. This is my, my attempt to create a graphic, ladies and gentlemen. So please don't come, up, uh, come to us for, for, for graphic design. Um, but what it tries to highlight is for communities to go out and try to knock on doors to Opportunity Zone funds to say, hey, come to my community, look at all the beautiful things that I have here, you should invest here. It's really tough and more often than not, it's almost a waste of time. There is that pre-development assessment phase that needs to happen on a local level, priorities, helping local developers advance things to a place where Opportunity Zone funds can actually step in. And, and Eric and Trey uh, and, and HUD and, 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 and Enterprise play a phenomenal role in doing so. By the way, thank you to HUD and, and Community Development Partners uh, for hosting this, this conference today. Um, but so, so you, you guys need to understand that, that and many, many uh, communities understand that, that there's a lot of work that is required before Opportunity Zone funds come into the, the, the city. Just trying to knock on the doors of those funds is not going to yield an immediate return. There's, there's a lot of, of pre-development and collaboration that needs to happen locally before that capital could start flowing into those, those communities. Next slide, please. So, uh, I, I, you know, we love highlighting, I just highlighted the, the uh, county of San Bernardino and the city of, of San Bernardino for one of the projects. I'd like to highlight another one. It's a small community, it's a distressed community in the high desert, the city of Atalanto, uh, that has a very proactive mayor and city manager uh, that are trying to go out there and, and bring in investments. And they've seen a lot of successes in the, in the last couple of years in, in really attracting a uh, new development and new, new investment to the table. We've worked with the county and with the city to create a community prospectus that highlights not only some of the successes that they had recently, but also available deals that are available there. What's most important to an investor is what, are, what is the type of mix of deals that are happening there? What are the tools that are available that one can couple with opportunities on investments? And what, a, what is the check size really that one is looking for? Next slide, please, Eric. Now, um, it, when, when it comes to, to the pipeline, we speak about underwriting and, and the marketplace. A, a pipeline is a mix of, of many things, I, I like to say. A lot of it, at the end of the day, from a community point of view, has to do with creating an interesting mix and showing the bottom, the double bottom line or the triple bottom line effect of those investments. I can tell you for a fact that impact investors are interested in impact. And so working with those communities to show in a very appealing way what not only the financial returns are for, for a project, but what are the jobs, how many companies are created because of that, how much carbon can be reduced what is the green energy that could be had, and so on, and support, and you know the quality of life, the number of housing that could be created. Those are things that immediately jump at an investor that just need to be shown on 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 marketing material. Now, diversification is good for cities and communities to have, but too much diversification shows that they're all over the place. So it's good to have a focus, and we we like to highlight that along the way as well. Uh, we like to work with a, with a platform called Opsites for a marketplace. There's a number of other players out there, uh, but Opsites has a mapping tool. It has uh, uh, some of the, the, the ArcGIS type uh, um, uh, data in there, uh, but there's many other tools out there that, that you could look at as well. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, because I come from private equity, I can tell you for a fact that very often deals just don't happen because there's no, because lenders are not at the table. And I've been that broken record that says, guys, we need to talk to banks. We need to have 
banks at the table. And you'd be surprised, almost shocked, if you layered out the list of CDFIs in your region, just go on the CDFI website, put it on a, slap it on a Google Maps, and you'd look at, uh, at where are they located. And you'd look at your geographic areas. If you look at CDEs or, or, uh, or small business investment corporations, you'll see it more often than not, those distressed communities just don't have access to that. Now, banks want to be part of the high impact projects because not, not only because it, it has good community impact and it's good from a marketing point of view, but under CRA, banks might be asked to document things like community plan, affordability requirements, or the impact of the projects or jobs that they've had in, in the communities that, 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 they have, that they take depository on. And so they want to participate in those deals and communicating it to them in such a manner actually attracts even more capital which lowers the amount of, of equity that is required, which, re, which increases the return, which in, in turn makes a deal more palatable. Um, and so not only do they want to be part of, part of opportunity zone deals, but uh, it, very often uh, banks want to be part of brokering such deals. What I mean by brokering is a bank working to bring investors into those areas. Not only can they earn fees for doing the work, it's interesting, um, they, they can actually participate uh, in them. So uh, one of, the, one of, the, one of the, uh, uh, the, the, the pieces that are interesting to know is that under certain conditions, banks can make an investment in a, in a qualified opportunities uh, fund under the Public Welfare Investment Authority. Um, the investment is generally permissible if it is designated primarily to promote the, the public welfare, including the welfare of low and moderate income communities and families. Um, the PWI, as it's often shortened, it regulates uh, the required qualified community development investment to primarily benefit low and moderate income individuals. Now, in addition, Section 13 of the Bank Holding Company Act, also known as the Volcker Rule, generally prohibits any banking entity from acquiring or retaining ownership interest or equity or in sponsoring or having a relationship with a hedge fund or equity, private equity fund. However, in July 2020, amendment to the Volcker Rule classified that, that covered fund does not include an issuer in a QOA, which means that banks can be both an investor and a lender, which brings tremendous investment capacity uh, from, from places that don't even have to do with, with private investors, capital gain taxes. It allows banks to actually participate and gives them other incentives. Next slide, please. Um, we spoke a little bit about the priorities and about focusing on priority. Eric, next slide, please. Um, so this, this one is a fun one, just highlighting again the, the, the city of Adelanto. I was on a tour the Saturday before last. One of the picture, the middle picture is this fine looking gentleman with the treasurer of the state of California um, who actually came out on a Saturday to tour opportunity zone uh, sites in the high desert of California. Okay, that's government uh, involvement in distressed communities trying to drive opportunity zone investments. And it was amazing. We spoke about state level incentives that could be had. We spoke about uh, high, uh, important uh, projects in the area and how the state could, could, partner, could partner with the county and with the city to drive a lot of those successes. Tremendous session. Um, uh, Eric, next slide, please. Now, in closing, and I've mentioned that in the beginning, we turn away industrial developers all the time who come to us and say, hey, I just want to build this, right? We turn away people who, have, who, who could go on it by, by itself and you know, just want to build self-storage or things that just don't have community impact. We always like to ask, what's the return, not only from a financial point of view, but how are you impacting the quality of life of the residents around this, this investment? And so we do a lot of technical assistance and I've listed some of the stuff that, that is on the left-hand side. I was just on a call with more than a hundred participants with, with, with a private bank. Whoever tells you there's not activity in opportunity zones, 
is not listening to the market. I can tell you that people are looking to invest in opportunity zones and trying to turn them away means that they will go elsewhere. And so we, we do a lot of that, that work on the, on the technical assistance stuff. In addition, we act as advisor and as a GP on some projects where local, um, where local representation is just needed. And last but not least, we are a, 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 a qualified financial lender in, in the state of California. So we can act as a lender and we can act as a, as a broker to them which more often than not, we use that license in order to, to, to create relationships between banks and investors, to make sure that those, those things happen correctly. And we then stay within the deal. Uh, Eric, next slide, please. I'll stop right there and open it to a q and A. I I know we only have a couple of minutes. Uh, thank you, Eric. Thank you so much, Gil, and thank you so much, Trey. Um, what I'm going to do is ask a couple of questions for our um, uh, speakers here, and then we'll open it up to questions to the line. So um, as you all are thinking through questions, you might want to ask um, the speakers here. Um, we'll be glad to share them. And I'm going to start out with Trey, um, and I have a question for Trey specifically. Um, in regards to how the state is approaching um, both uh, staffing, kind of like how you're looking at the different diversity of the state and the regions and potential other funding you may be looking at through other federal agencies, um, including uh, if you're working and leveraging any CDBG funds. Yeah, so one, one thing is uh, we, at the beginning of the pandemic, well, first within California, we have a smaller agency within GoBiz but one of the efforts that we did under GoBiz for economic development was called Regions Rise Together. And this was really thinking inclusively about economic development, California's diverse regions and connecting to one, each, one another. And, you know, it was a really with the initial focus on the inland areas of the state. And it's now expanded to include other regions such as our Central Coast and our Far North region. So we were able to use to create four new positions within GoBiz, uh, both in territory in these regions, Central Coast, Central Valley, Inland Empire and Far North. And during the pandemic, uh, you know, we're working with the EDA potentially for a tentative for approval for five more positions, including in those same regions with an additional one in our Imperial Valley uh, to the southeast of the state. And uh, really all of these folks were really to bring in together to be able to work with communities and economic development professionals at the local level to be able to, you know, spur projects and be able to be there on the ground to be able to go really quickly to go do a meeting in Adelanto and not have to fly from Sacramento, uh, which can be quite a way. Uh, so the the really the idea was to put in territory folks who have familiarity with opportunity zones, other place based incentives at the state that align with the incentive, um, and then in turn, because of those increased staff in, in 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 territory, we've been using our federal partners team and our state partners team to be able to channel resources to support those staff within those areas to do economic development, such as opportunity zones. And, and because of that leverage of, of, of working with both state and then of course the individual federal agencies is we've really opened up a different type of window in thinking about economic development and pairing different tools and funding with uh, to execute projects. And so one effort we're exploring right now with broadband is with uh, the community development block grant program and the economic developments, uh, EA, economic development administrations uh, uh, EAA program. Um, so those are both funding that are kind of different, different agencies under different departments within the federal government, but they very much are looking to achieve similar goals in many respects. You know, those two funding sources, and then how can we bring some of what the governor's has in the budget for broadband funding, um, you know, later down in our line to be able to support that project development. So we're working on something right now to be able to do kind of that kind of a um, you know, capital stack building of different funding sources at the federal and state level. And really, I guess the pandemic is what spurred a lot of this partnership across the board and this, this really, you know, stress need that we need staff within region to be able to support the communities and businesses there. 
Thank you so much, Trey. And for, for Gil, you know, you had mentioned the, the County of San Bernardino, both large in scope and broad in economic base, um, and what it's trying to attract capital from small cities to large, uh, larger metropolitan areas and the diversity of the needs. Can you, can you share a little bit about the leadership in the county and how they kind of worked with you um, with the, as a FUSE fellow when you came on board and how the, the county leadership kind of looked at it? from the approach to help all the diversity of the opportunity zones across the county. Yeah, um, sure, Eric. Uh, first of all, I have, me as a private person coming in work to work with government, I've gained a new level of respect for what it means to work in government. Uh, the private sector often does not understand the, the, uh, the details that it takes to run community development and economic development, and just listening, sitting there in, in my little cubicle and listening to my neighbor speak to tenants and helping them with shopping and getting them into their unit and it, just a day-to-day -day type of work that community development does in San Bernardino County with some, some really distressed communities. It is amazing. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't understand that as a person from the outside. Now, at the same time, because it is such a large region, the county is forced to work within certain guidelines. So a guy like me who comes in and likes to steer the pot, there needs to be a certain level of comfort. And anybody who knows me knows that I steer the pot. And you know, for a person to go between departments, between hierarchies, has no problem to go in the knock on the door of the CEO of the county or, or one of the supervisors to have an open conversation those are things that usually don't happen on, on, in a government setting, as well as then going and talking to mayors and city managers, right? And, and just opening up and, and having an open dialogue. And it actually generated a lot of learning out of it. I can tell you that as long as there is an open discussion and a transparent discussion about, look, we're coming here to listen and to try to work through the problems, there was very much a willingness to listen. Um, in some places, you need to show that you're, you're trying to, to offer the same tools to everybody involved. So you, you really can't show favoritism to one city over another, to one project over another, as much as you know that, that there would be so much more impact if you did this versus that, you need to work through a framework of an RFP or whatever else it is. And because of that, sometimes you, you miss a certain timeline, but you try to push the, 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 uh, the, the borders as much as you can. Uh, you try to work through the gray as much as you can uh, while not putting yourself at jeopardy. Um, and I can tell you the county has been very open to it. And, and at times there was just discussion about, Gil, we really, we really get it, but let's try to do it in a different way. One of the things that I will tell you, Eric, is you put all this thing in and then COVID happens and it happened to all of us. And, and the county was really great about continuing to push to try to find investments and try to push the program even during times of COVID when you needed to realign a lot of the real resources to other, to other things. I can tell you that I've seen many places, many states around uh, the, the, the U.S. that have basically cut out an economic development uh, staffing. I am, and, and I often speak about it. They've basically eliminated economic development or community development during that time. Not the county of San Bernardino and not the state of California. They continued to put their money where their mouth was, which, uh, which was terrific. And we see that as we come out of this pandemic now. Thank you so much, Gil. Yeah, and I think it's so important for, for both our CDBG grantees, those working with CDBG funds or other HUD grants, to see this integration and alignment of importance of county programs, county officials, city officials, from you know, small cities like Adelanto to the county of San Bernardino to the state of California and the governor's team to the federal government and how the planning efforts and attraction of investments and the focus on the community is so important. So at this, I'd like to turn it over to any questions. We can open mic it, um, uh, Orlando, and see if we have any open questions for the panelists. No, we don't have any open questions for the panelists. Um, I think there are a couple of questions for you, Eric. Okay. 
Um, yes, I see two questions here about suggestions. Yes, I will get back to both these people around um, pasting information, a follow up, and you'll have it with the slide deck on some of those uh, issues. So I will get back to both those in, a, in the Q&A. But um, another thing I've been, I'll ask the panelists before we close out here, I think we have Orlando, what, about two more minutes here or one or two more minutes here? Yes, we have a couple yeah. more minutes. Okay, so if anyone has a question, feel free to raise it. But I have a question for both Trey and for Gil. Um, in the opportunity zone marketplace, you know, many people focus on the fact that um, there's two, two aspects. One is the concern over the, the neighborhoods of high urban areas where there's the potential for gentrification with displacement. But then you talked a lot about Trey and Gill, areas that are outside of urban areas, right? That are not the urban core where opportunity zones are and their perspectives are very different, as you said, from urban areas and understanding those differences. And so maybe Trey, if you can talk about how the state has approached that you shared about these five separate regions that are not the urban areas and what you're trying to do. And then Gil, from the perspective of, you talked about, you know, mountain areas and desert areas and, you know, and, and also the urban areas of the county. So just the perspective of that diversity of the OZs and how you're addressing that. Yeah, I'll jump in first. Um, and, and, and I'd just say broadly in economic development, there's a lot of interest in this right now. I think, I think there's one thing we see across the board is a lot of people have the mindset of the time is now um, to go forth and do something in economic development, whether that's build a hospital, do a community center, do something with housing and mixed use somewhere uh, within the state. Uh, so there is a lot of interest in leveraging opportunity zones. But I think that to go back to Gil's point and Gil's, you know, his organization is really great in thinking about, you know, our focus is on distressed communities, helping out these areas that may not have other seen investment broadly, is that maybe the tax incentive doesn't work for some reason or the other within an area of the state. Or maybe there's a local investor who has capital gains who's you know, just looking to invest generally, maybe they don't really, you know, maybe there's not a strong interest in learning about opportunity zone incentive, but maybe there's another way to bring them in the equation of the deal, right, uh, to make it work. And so uh, I think that really what we're sharing with, you know, some of the rural areas is that it's, 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 you don't have to just think about the tax incentive to achieve whatever you're trying to achieve within the area that you're looking at. Here's all these other state programs that support that same type of project development. Here's the preferential pointing to go get all of these federal programs that are out right now, which you should be leveraging to go get federal dollars and all of these bills. Um, and you know, there's other ways to do your project with private development. You don't have to have the opportunity zone tax incentive to achieve what you want to achieve within there for that community that needs that project. So that's really the thing that we're stressing is because you know, I think some people give up. They're like, oh, this thing doesn't work for me or uh, this thing may not just pencil out or this tax incentive is not for my type of community. But it's like, but that area is an area that you know needs it. It's why you brought it to the attention and the forefront. How can I use this here? Because you know that you want to do something there. So don't fall short of short sighting uh, the fact that things are possible. There's always a means to find a way, leverage the right tools to make the project happen. Yeah, I'll add on, and, and maybe that's me coming from private equity. We see distress. For us, distress means opportunity, okay? And when, when things are down, it means they can go up a lot. And so the, the, from, from an investment point of view, um, I, I come in with those type of eyes and I say, look, guys, we, can only, we, we need to lift this up and look at, look at the sky's the limit here. Um, I want to highlight the fact that, uh, that there are organizations, HUD is great, 108, we, have, we barely spoke about the 108 loan guarantee program that can be coupled against CD, CDBG in order to leverage CDBG funds to create whole communities, huge. Um, but there are other ones like USDA. Did you know that USDA can issue up to $100 million guarantee for community facilities in, in, in remote communities? $100 million. Imagine how far the money can go and what, what great returns those could mean to local investors. So yes, we, we love um, more distressed communities. We love that. We have a lot of them in San Bernardino uh, and a lot of upsides to, to be coupled with, with everything we discussed today. Well, thank you very much, Gil. Thank you very much, Trey. Um, I, I am I'm really appreciative of you sharing today. Um, as you heard, um, you know, I'm Eric Yost. I'm, I'm our current um, also acting branch chief 
for our place-based initiatives team in our HUD Office of Field Policy and Management. Um, the, our FPM team at HUD supports um, uh, the department's place-based initiatives, including the implementation of opportunity zones. And I'm really thrilled to have a chance to represent um, the FPM team and our work today and their hard work. So on behalf of HUD, I'm really have, um, pleased to have you joined us during this two-day Opportunity Zone virtual roundtable, which was jointly co-hosted with HUD's Office of Community Planning and Development, along with our Office of Field Policy and Management for those in our regional and field offices in HUD regions 9 and 10 in the West Coast. And our work today is really at the forefront of the Biden-Harris administration's immediate priorities for our communities that is really focused on COVID-19, economic recovery, racial equity, and climate change. We're all really part of the American Rescue Plan efforts to address and support our community's needs and help them recover. So as we as communities kind of continue to focus on the health response to the pandemic and the effect of our most vulnerable communities, we're also focused on the economic hardship from the pandemic while addressing issues of racial equity and environmental justice. The needs in these communities to recover from the pandemic, including the opportunity zones are vast and we all recognize how much more work must be done. So this event was really focused on raising awareness of opportunity zone investment, focused on that social impact aspect and how you as HUD grantees can leverage HUD grants and programs with opportunity zone investment, along with federal, state and local um, resources in the private and public sector. And most importantly, how we together can help and not harm our communities. The administration is committed to reforming opportunity zones as I shared with that focus on incentivizing the funds to partner with nonprofits or community oriented organizations to really produce that community benefits plan that you heard about today and partnering with state and local government for focused on creating jobs for low income residents that otherwise wouldn't have really had a direct financial impact um, within the opportunity zones and our team at HUD is focused on providing technical assistance to ensure that this opportunity zone ecosystem we talked about and investments advance racial equity, build more affordable housing, prevent displacement of residents and businesses, support the broad minority owned small business creation by incre and also increasing home ownership and low income urban, rural and tribal communities with that strong environmental justice lens and environmental equity. So we have this potential now, as you heard, to dramatically level the playing field for these disenfranchised and distressed communities that are seeking this public and private capital for a more inclusive recovery from the pandemic. And it'd be really critical for us to bring together both public and private efforts to make these transformative changes that communities need and that the residents have a chance to be engaged with. So the presenters you heard from are really at the forefront of ensuring that Opportunity Zone and incentive benefits communities we serve and sharing some best practices. And we know there are many out there across the West Coast for building strong relationships with the Opportunity Zone investment ecosystem around our community-based organizations, nonprofits, resident-based organizations. So I wanted to thank all our presenters um, thank you to our HUD grantees for your continued commitment to ensuring HUD grants are benefiting those most at need for economic development. And we'll be working at HUD alongside you as we help our communities to recover um, by leveraging both the American Rescue Plan and um, in the future, the American Jobs Plan. I really wanted to thank the leadership and team in HUD's Office of Community Planning and Development for their continued partnership with the Office of Field Policy and Management to build capacity in our communities to leverage opportunity zones for their intended purpose. I also wanted to thank the leadership and the staff throughout HUD's region nine and 10 and the regional offices and field offices, their leadership and staff for their continued commitment in support of building capacity, sharing resources and engaging in the public and private partners and community stakeholders. Um, lastly, I wanted to recognize and appreciate our partners from Enterprise Community um, Housing Partnership for helping us to organize and conduct this event. Um, and I'll now turn it back over to Enterprise to close the event. Thank you. Thank you for joining today in our 
uh, that will conclude our webinar. Thank you all very much.